Previously on Middleside Topwise. I'll tell you right now that there are way more trans guys trying to kick ass in men's sports than there are hairy 6'3 dudes like me transitioning so they can dominate women's sports. That shit has literally never happened, yet every single shaved head white guy with a podcast can't stop fantasizing about it. Shortly after releasing our last video essay, I received a comment that questions my credibility as a content creator and suggests that there are 23 examples that disprove my statement about transgender athletes. This led me down a very deep rabbit hole of misogynistic junk science and religious fundamentalism that has provided me with many valuable insights into the history of the gender construct. What started as a video about trans women not being very good at sports, and trust me, we'll get to that, has now become a treatise on the biological, political, and spiritual nature of the transgender experience. In this process, I have come to learn that the free expression of femininity is the most rebellious act anyone can engage in. I think it's about time the gay brothers and sisters got their rights, and especially the women. There will be three types of people that watch this video, and it's going to be up to you to decide which group you fall into. The first group are those of you who believe that you benefit from a strict gender binary, and are intent on keeping it in place. You have rejected the scientific consensus of the last 50 years simply because it complicates your understanding of the world. You don't want choices, you want your gender options to look like a Cuban grocery store. No amount of data will change your mind on these topics because your only goal is to create a scapegoat. Then, there's a much larger group of you who want to accept the reality of the gender spectrum, but have a pretty poor understanding of what that actually means, and end up perpetuating a lot of harmful stereotypes when it comes to things like trans athletes or gender-affirming care for minors. LGBTQIA allyship is not about supporting the civil liberties of a classified minority group, but allowing space for their experiences to influence our lives. This movement has become so capitalist. That doesn't mean everyone has to try out cross-dressing or gay sex. It does mean that we get to challenge our collective understanding of what masculinity and femininity really mean. For example, my journey helped me to realize that I am asexual, or the A in LGBTQIA+. I actually think this might be the case for many people who have an aversion to graphic sexuality. If all that sounds like a big hassle, and you just want to live your life without having all this identity politics shoved down your throat, then this video should be an indication that you are, in fact, part of the first group. Finally, there are those of us who are secure in ourselves and live by the Socratic mantra, I know that I know nothing. You immerse yourself in the unfamiliar because you overstand that vulnerability breeds strength. In this security, you see each human experience as novel and valuable without placing judgment on it or demanding control over it. In this video, we will parse out those who have adopted regressive views about gender and sexuality due to societal pressure from those who believe that femininity is an inherently inferior trait that is deserving of repression and subservience. So let's begin. And gender related health care. The trans movement is in Indiana with transgender. Ban on transgender tracking. As transgender, that news is a three transgender African American transgender woman. In his 1962 work, How to Do Things with Words, British philosopher of language John L. Austin argues that very few statements actually contain logical truth value, and most of human communication is made up of what he calls performative utterances, which are made to invoke a certain perlocutionary effect in the listener. Girls between the ages of like 17 and 24 is when they're technically most fertile. Yeah. Okay? That's biological. That's a fact, all right? I'm just stating facts. That's all I'm doing. As long as there's a shred of plausible deniability, there will always be people denying the obvious perlocutionary effect of the statement being made. From Roe v. Wade to gay marriage to Cardi B to drag shows, debates around transgender inclusion are all seemingly benign entry points to the idea that feminine presenting people are a detriment to American society. In March of 2023, NPR's Sergio Olmos accompanied a literal neo-Nazi to an act of petty vandalism in order to learn more about far-right indoctrination. Seeing an increase in recruitment numbers after a series of drag show protests, Eric Nunez, the leader of National Socialist Florida, also takes credit for spreading both anti-critical race theory rhetoric and the Kanye was right hashtag as ways to attract young men, quote, looking for meaning and trapped in a digital culture. He also states that it bothers him when people call Antifa the real Nazis, 
and works very hard to dispel that idea, while avoiding confrontations with local anti-fascist organizations. You can't make this stuff up, folks. As hundreds of Republican-sponsored anti-trans bills are proposed across the country, creating a bigger government that limits the individual freedoms of American citizens, Nunez's projection of a giant cross intertwined in a swastika without the building owner's consent has just recently been made a misdemeanor in the city of Jacksonville. Any projection at all, not just hateful ones. The people who want a white Christian male dominated society are cowards that lack compassion and empathy, but they're not stupid. Well, they aren't Christian either. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Matthew 19, 12. A lot of people like to argue that the word homosexual is not actually in the Bible. This is true. It has nothing to do with being gay. Christians are actually taught that all of human existence is inherently evil and that women are to blame for it. All of it. That means anyone expressing femininity in any way is giving in to original sin and going against God. He says his 100 plus congregation is focused on nurturing the community from what he calls the COVID coma, fighting discrimination and serving those in poverty together as one. Jesus said you gotta be one. We have to be one. The story of Adam and Eve doesn't just condemn women, it gives Christians the ability to rebuke any information not approved by the church. First Timothy chapter two and verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. So, cause the Bible says so, um, and that's it. Once that's understood, they're treated no differently than the animals on Noah's Ark. Seriously, go look up the words a male and female in the Bible. Most instances are in reference to livestock, not people. Roman Antiquities is the 20 volume work by first century BCE historian Dionysus of Halicarnassus that details the history of the Roman Republic, including its state sanctioned class and gender mandates. Using a technique known as Dionysian imitatio, where an author creatively elaborates on an older source text, he would tell the tale of Aristodemus Malichus, an ancient Greek tyrant who intentionally feminized young men so they wouldn't rise up against him. About a hundred years later, Stoic philosopher Epictetus would use the term malikos to mean one who is unable to absorb the true philosophy, or what we would refer to today as a smooth brain. He and his proto-feminist mentor Musonius Rufus, who taught that women were just as capable as men and should be treated as such, would be exiled by two different Roman emperors. By the time Christianity was made into the Roman state religion at the Council of Nicaea, the term malakoi was being tossed around to describe anything from ancient metrosexuals, who softened their appearance by shaving and bathing regularly, to the worshippers of the Fergian goddess Cybele, consort of Jupiter, an analog to Minerva and Isis. Need I remind you that before this, the Roman Empire was a pagan imperial cult that absorbed other religions through colonization and deified their political leaders by way of Sol Invictus, the male sun god whose annual celebration occurred on the winter solstice. With this in mind, the story of Jesus of Nazareth, a queer indigenous communist who was killed by police for protesting the blind worship of government officials, was merged with the Roman state's pagan solar deity in the creation of Nicene Christianity. A few hundred years later, a guy named Mohammed, peace be upon him, started going around telling people that the New Testament was a distortion of the true gospel of Jesus, and that he alone had been transmitted the final doctrine of God via the Archangel Gabriel. That's right, folks. Since its inception, Islam has never challenged the divinity of Christ, but the mainstream Christian narrative that God was somehow able to be killed by man. Instead, accepting the Gnostic theory that he was literally replaced by Simon on the cross. However, the Prophet Muhammad did not tell people to abandon material life like his predecessor, and immediately began acquiring political power, culminating in the almost bloodless coup of Mecca in 630 CE. For all intents and purposes, this probably seemed like the fulfillment of revelation to many Muslims, to the chagrin of European Christians. Now, I'm not suggesting that Islam is some paragon of gender equality. 
Here's an interesting story from the 9th century that portrays a conservative elder chastising the autonomy of the Prophet Muhammad's many wives, who I'm pretty sure were all underage. Pause to read. The point of saying all this is that soon after, the success of Islamic imperialism would trigger the Spanish Reconquista, which overlapped with both the Crusades and the Inquisitions. And for the next 700 years, the vague charge of heresy was used to convict anyone involved in not merely religious division, but social upset and political strife. This crime was often accompanied by accusations of sodomy and same-sex relations, as with the folks known as the Cathars, who viewed all human gender and sex characteristics as a violation of the sexless, dual nature of God, and the Knights Templar, who worshipped the androgynous being known as Baphomet, and were heavily influenced by Islamic Gnosticism. Another notable example is Joan of Arc, who in 1431 would be accused of heresy and dressing as a male, and was burned at the stake. The Reconquista finally came to an end in January 1492 with the defeat of Muslim forces at Grenada, and in July of 1492, the Alhambra Decree forcibly expelled 200,000 Jewish people from Spain for the crime of heresy. Anti-LGBTQ sentiment became law with 1532's Constitutio Criminalis Carolina, the original penal code of the Holy Roman Empire made murder, manslaughter, robbery, arson, witchcraft, and sexual relations between men punishable by death. In 1533, an act for the punishment of the vice of buggery was passed by Henry VIII, which outlawed anal intercourse and led to the confiscation of one's land and possessions by the government. It was not until 1791 that the French Revolutionary Penal Code abolished all victimless crimes, including sodomy, heresy, witchcraft, and blasphemy, stating that the new Constituent Assembly only sought to punish true crimes, not the artificial offenses condemned by superstition. In 1868, Hungarian human rights activist Karl Maria Kurtbeni would invent the terms heterosexual and homosexual. In a private letter to sexologist Karl Heinrich Ehrlichs, he also reports that heterosexuals were much more prone to… all of this activity that I will not be repeating out loud. By 1871, Germany's paragraph 175 would criminalize a number of acts, including immoral sexual activity between men and public cross-dressing. Still, between the years of 1899 and 1923, Physician Magnus Hirschfeld was able to amass over 20,000 pages of data on homosexual and transgender people that demonstrated a natural spectrum of sexual and gender identities across all cultures and time periods. This led to the creation of transvestite certificates, which allowed German citizens to publicly wear clothes that contradicted their assigned biological sex. Inspired by Hirschfeld, the Bolshevik Penal Code of 1922 called for the removal of anti-sodomy laws, only to be reintroduced by Stalin in 1934. The reason gender and sexuality is not more widely understood today is because in 1933, just four months into the Nazi campaign, Hirschfeld's institute was sacked, and all but a few documents were destroyed. Of the many killed in these attacks was Dora Richter, who is said to be the first person to undergo gender reassignment surgery. Ernst Röhm, head of the Nazi paramilitary wing that conducted raids like these, was openly homosexual himself, but was said to be spared due to his complete rejection of femininity in favor of militarized masculinity, or the Nazi principle of the Mannerbund. Never having a girlfriend, never having sex with a woman, really makes you more heterosexual, because honestly, dating women is gay. Until Hitler didn't need him anymore labeling Rome's brown shirts, quote, an undisciplined mob of street thugs. Why claw? He personally arrested Rome in his hotel suite, executing other gay Nazi officials on site. While in prison, Rome was given the opportunity to take his own life, to which he replied, if I am to be killed, let Adolf do it himself. <laughs> Later that year, these extrajudicial murders were legalized via the one-paragraph decree known as the Law Regarding Measures of State Self-Defense, and was defended by many citizens who believed Hitler was restoring order to the country. Here's a guy in the comments of the last video saying the reason Rome was killed was because he was 
and I quote, causing instability. Uh, yeah, that was Hitler's argument for everyone. In 1936, the Reich Central Office for the Combating of Homosexuality and Abortion was formed, and from there, over 100,000 LGBTQ people were taken into custody, with upwards of 15,000 sent to concentration camps. Despite the fall of Nazi Germany in 1945, and many challenges from East German communists, paragraph 175 would stay intact after the war, only to see updates to the age of consent in the 1960s and 70s. It was not repealed until 1994. Between 1945 and 1994, there was this thing called the sexual revolution, in which the children of the people who lived through the Depression and World War II were given unparalleled levels of privilege, and used it to reject the strict gender roles and religious dogma that dominated their ancestors. In response, people like unambiguous racist William H. Parker would use what is commonly known as the Walking While Trans Law to target LGBTQ-friendly establishments across Los Angeles, including the infamous Cooper Donuts Raid of 1959. His work as LA police chief would be featured on a short-lived, unabashedly propagandistic TV show titled The Thin Blue Line. Two years before the Stonewall Uprising, LA's Black Cat Tavern was raided by police on New Year's Eve, arresting 14 patrons for public lewdness just after the stroke of midnight. This event would lead to the creation of The Advocate, a bi-weekly magazine distributed by the radical political organization Personal Rights in Defense and Education, or PRIDE. A major turning point for the traditional American masculine image was the horrific violence depicted on the news during Vietnam, namely the highly publicized 1968 mass shooting of 22 unarmed Vietnamese civilians by Lieutenant William Calley in the My Lai Massacre. This led many Americans to question the national equation of manhood and patriotism. And soon, a subcategory of white middle-class men began to arise who were more influenced by black, queer, and feminist representations of masculinity than they were Frank Sinatra, John Wayne, or Uncle Sam. In 1974, Pride would sell The Advocate to David Goodstein, a Wall Street investment banker who immediately fired the staff and brought in writers who appealed to, quote, the upwardly mobile homosexual who has a home in the hills, drives a luxury car, and orders alcohol by brand. In 1979, Pope John Paul II had begun a series of lectures entitled Theology of the Body, where he confirms the church's biological essentialist stance on human sexuality and gender. This coincided with Professor Janice Raymond's infamous turf manual, The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the She-Male, calling it an important achievement New York Times columnist and transgender critic Thomas Saz ironically ends his review of the book with this insight. If the war between sexes ever ends, it will be not because of a phony armistice arranged by doctors, but because men, women, and children will place personal dignity before social sex role identity. Personal dignity, you say? Hmm. In 1985, the Ratzinger Report was written by German Cardinal and future Pope Benedict XVI in opposition to homosexuality and feminist gender theory. The eventual repeal of paragraph 175 in Germany coincided with the UN's International Conference on Population and Development of 1994 and the World Conference on Women in 1995, which both called for greater access to reproductive and sexual health services across the globe. Sexual health is a concept that goes beyond pregnancy and sexually transmitted disease prevention and includes a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. It was right around this time that a man by the name of Joseph Overton began pitching the idea of independent research institutes or what we commonly refer to as think tanks, to corporations, politicians, and religious groups. In 1997, anti-abortion journalist Dale O'Leary wrote The Gender Agenda, which tells the tale of a radical Marxist feminist conspiracy being perpetrated by globalist NGOs. In her free time, Miss O'Leary just happens to be a part of the highly secretive and influential Opus Dei, 
the Conservative Catholic Society that answers directly to the Pope. If you'd like to read the gender agenda, I found a copy of it over on the German Institute for Youth and Society website. 2001's The Hidden Face of United Nations by Belgian priest Michael Schoolians accuses the UN of trying to deify the earth and desacralize man, and threatens that NAMBLO will use updates in human rights laws to protect themselves from prosecution. A Catholic priest said this. Cardinal Ratzinger, aka God's Rottweiler, would become Pope in 2005 only to be marred by abuse scandals and persistent talk of his upbringing as a Nazi. As they always do, the Nazi dog backed down, and his successor, Pope Francis, would be named the Advocate's Person of the Year, despite his agreement with Benedict that modern gender theory is ideological colonization. In 2019, a group of bishops compiled a list of quotes from Francis called declaration of the truths relating to some of the most common errors in the life of the church of our lifetime, which clearly states that homosexual acts under no circumstances can be approved. It also reasserts the church's stance on gay marriage, which seeks to police civil unions of non-Catholics, essentially making the act of marriage a closed cultural practice. The document goes on to provide rules for transgender people. At no point do they say anything about their concern for mental health, fairness to women, or the safety of children. A similar document, known as the Nashville Statement, was compiled in 2017 by the Evangelical Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. In search of an imaginary enemy, Catholic collective narcissism and the endorsement of gender conspiracy beliefs explores how this regressive decree has been used by fascists to drum up a fake culture war against Christian family and religious values. Feelings of low personal control have been linked with increased beliefs in God, endorsement of conspiracy beliefs, as well as national collective narcissism. At the same time, both national collective narcissism and conspiracy beliefs seem to decrease following inductions of feelings of personal control. It is then at least plausible that we could reduce defensive religious identification as well as gender conspiracy beliefs by increasing feelings of personal control. Today, far-right groups like Reconquista Germanica are using a familiar combination of Roman, Spanish, and German imagery to fuel this socio-political holy war well into the 21st century. Meanwhile, fart lord Janice Raymond returned in 2021 with a new book titled Doublethink, a feminist challenge to transgenderism, which is said to pull heavily from the work of anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist Jennifer Bilek. As of 2023, 69 countries criminalize consensual sexual acts between adults of the same sex, punishable by death in nine. 14 U.S. states still have similar sodomy laws on the books. Do you want the individual freedoms America offers to all of its citizens? Or do you want the country to look more like Iran? You gotta pick one. Authoritarianism and tyranny spawn from the unfulfilled desires of pure, imbalanced masculinity. Every single act of oppression is the result of the masculine urge to dominate, divide, and control. It's clear to anyone that material reality exists on a spectrum. Hot and cold, high and low, dark and light. Everything has its extreme and its opposite, with infinite gradations between. This is best expressed through the Chinese philosophical concept of yin and yang, which was first introduced as a sign of feminine leadership during the imperialist unification of China. In this sense, we could say that there are tall people who are not at all short, and short people who are not at all tall. Still, everyone falls somewhere on the spectrum. We all possess the essence of tallness and shortness to some degree relative to others. This is the case for all human characteristics. A man and a woman who have a physician's mind have the same nature. Plato. Plato's theory of forms states that for any conceivable thing, there is a corresponding form, a perfect example of that thing. It is said that the human soul traverses this metaphysical plane before birth, picking up key attributes along the way. 
For example, if one wants to be an architect, they must have had access to the ideal forms of building. According to Plato, this information cannot be learned simply through exposure. In his work, Parimenides, Plato presents this theory in a somewhat satirical and self-critical manner, his mentor Socrates challenging him every step of the way. His main critique? If ideal forms exist for trees and ships and men and women, then they must also exist for more mundane objects, like hair and dirt. In so doing, Socrates offers an alternative to essentialism, nominalism, the core tenet of cynicism, stoicism, and Buddhism. Nominalist beliefs are often misinterpreted as rejecting metaphysics entirely, when in fact, the Buddha simply stated that form itself is an illusion, and that the realms of creation described by philosophers and priests could also be transcended. Aristotle, the father of Western science and by far the douchiest of the big three Greek philosophers, took Plato's idea and ran with it making a number of claims as to the origins of living things, including huge generalizations about the role of women in the reproductive process and society as a whole. As regards the sexes, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior, the male ruler and the female subject. Aristotle. In On the Generation of Animals, he assigns active maleness to sperm and passive femaleness to menstrual blood, a direct reference to the Eleusinian mysteries. Aristotle also supported geocentrism, or the long-held belief that the sun revolves around the earth, and the concept of spontaneous generation, in which many beings, from insects to eels to geese, were thought to arise from dead matter. He equated this process to the end formation of female matter by the agency of the male seed. These ideas were accepted for nearly 2,000 years. In the early 1600s, acclaimed chemist Jan Baptiste van Helmont described a recipe for fully grown mice that involved storing a piece of dirty cloth with a loaf of bread for 21 days and another for scorpions that involved placing basil between two bricks and leaving it in the sun. These experiments would be publicly mocked by Louis Pasteur in 1864, who debunked them with his revolutionary understanding of microbiology. In On Spontaneous Generation, he wisely proclaims, When we adopt a historical perspective, it becomes clear that the trajectory of this doctrine follows the pattern typical of false notions. Instead of expanding over time, as only the truth can, it has been steadily shrinking, circumscribing itself ever more narrowly. Louis Pasteur. The two-gender model is kind of like spontaneous generation. Instead of looking at the entire process of creating an adult human being, which includes the development of a brain with vastly more neurons than animals, and then the complex interaction of genes and hormones that we do not even remotely understand, and then 25 years of social conditioning, the biological essentialist points to an ever-shrinking set of data, ascribing a very complex process to a simple binary. When biologists refer to the ideal male or female form, they simply mean one with all the necessary parts for reproduction. This is what is known as one's sex condition. If there is an issue with one's ability to reproduce, they are said to have a sex disorder. The cause of this disorder can be mental, or physical, or both. As we can see, this classification system can be used as a scientific backing for prejudice of all kinds. Instead of expanding our understanding of human biology, society's ills are blamed on those who are biologically disordered. Order, of course, being ruled by a mysterious force that imbues us all with characteristics in ways we cannot possibly understand. This hysteria is then used to steer public opinion towards the demonization and removal of classified minority groups, and away from public health and education initiatives. External things are not the problem. It's your assessment of them, which you can erase right now. Marcus Aurelius. Science is the documentation of observations over time. There is no value judgment or ideological loyalty involved. If data challenges your understanding of things, you integrate that data. It is accepted science that a percentage of many animal species are interested in same-sex relations. It is also accepted science that many gay, trans, and queer humans exhibit these behaviors from a young age. 
regardless of who or what they are exposed to. Stigma around and forced repression of these behaviors is traumatizing for both youths and adults. You know, they came in and they were screaming about, like, pedophilia and saying things like, we have to save the children. And I mean, they were terrifying the children. Whereas affirmation of people's natural inclinations leads to improved health and well-being. There are many normal conditions, such as gynecomastia, where underage children undergo surgery to reduce the stress caused by unwanted sex characteristics. Girls with PCOS are often given hormone blockers to reduce their natural production of testosterone. This affects up to 15% of people assigned female at birth. You can label these people anomalies, or you can just be an adult and internalize the fact that about 15% of the population is going to have some problems with the sex characteristics they've been given. Even studies that report an increase in mortality and psychological issues amongst transgender people call for improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment. This study was brought to my attention by someone arguing against gender-affirming care. So your solution is to expand access to healthcare beyond the Nordic model? Sounds great. For over 50 years, the scientific consensus has been that a multi-pronged approach inclusive of medical, social, educational, and policy-level interventions is crucial in combating the mental health disparities seen amongst transgender and gender non-conforming youth. Furthermore, there is absolutely no science whatsoever that correlates one's ability to produce sperm or ova to their sense of identity, sexual attractions, childcare capacity, personal interests, tendencies towards gossip, violence or compassion, or love of, and competence for, sports. Biological essentialism is a belief system that appropriates the authority of science. It is a hasty generalization, wrapped in a false cause, slathered in confirmation bias, and delicately perched on a slippery slope. If you want to tell your kids that their gametes determine what clothes they're allowed to wear in public, I, I guess you're free to do that, but don't call it science. By definition, an ideal form is not attainable. No man will ever be the ideal form of a man, and no woman will ever be the ideal form of a woman. Therefore, a man is someone who is inspired by the essence of manhood, and a woman is someone who is inspired by the essence of womanhood, regardless of the features they are able to exhibit. We may also feel compelled by both or neither. This is normal and natural. If some psycho-spiritual essence does exist, there is no connection between it and one's biology. The complexity of the human mind transcends what is visible to the naked eye. You can accept this fact or continue to try to control people's lives with an archaic and unscientific belief system. There is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. Margaret Thatcher. When we talk about the patriarchy, we are not talking about a situation that can be mitigated by putting more women in positions of power. Will she tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight against a single currency and an independent central bank when she leaves office? No, she's going to be the governor. On the present structure... <laughs> For the last 100 years at least, we have lived in a world of manufactured insecurity. We are ruthlessly categorized and pitted against each other from birth, while those who rise to power make prosperity increasingly harder to access. This animalistic competition is then presented to us as human nature. A huge proportion of people who are seriously disaffected are men. Most people in prison are men. Most people who are uh, on the street are men. Most victims of violent crime are men. Even a guy like Jordan Peterson recognizes that the patriarchy is a system where competition and hierarchy forces all of us to do terrible things to ourselves and others, and hurts men just as much as it does women. Alternatively, we could have a system that guarantees security for all, where equal access to resources is prioritized over endless military funding and corporate job-creating initiatives that need stimulus packages every 10 years. The common response to this is that people would lose their ambition and become lazy. So what you're saying is, one, human nature is not actually to compete, but to find ways to sit on our asses all day. And two, all the people who are trying to compete in sports and business and the arts right now 
but can't because of financial constraints, would just give up on their life dreams if they had access to free food and housing? Human nature is to self-actualize. In order to do this, we need to feel secure, which comes from a sense of community and cooperation, not just in the family unit, but the world around us. The technological advancements of the past century, you know, the ones that came from all the competition, have given more people access to the sense of security they need to self-actualize. This is called behavioral modernity. 2014's craniofacial feminization, social tolerance, and the origins of behavioral modernity reveals a significant drop in testosterone levels during the middle Pleistocene era that led to observable changes in human bone structure, and coincided with a period of increased social tolerance and the rapid fluorescence of new technologies, such as bone and antler workings, heat treatment and pressure flaking of flint, long-range projectile weapons, fishing and birding gear, trapping technology, sophisticated pyrotechnology, and possibly watercraft. All classically feminine activities, of course. Commending humanity for our high degree of social tolerance and remarkable capacity for pro-social helping, the authors don't attribute the influx of world-changing innovations to competition, but our extraordinary capacity for cumulative technological evolution, otherwise known as cultural ratcheting. Meanwhile, competition involving attempts to acquire or defend real or perceived resources such as status, territory, partners, and power increases testosterone levels in both men and women, as does the mere handling of firearms, which has been shown to encourage reckless behavior after just one interaction. The challenge hypothesis states that testosterone is strongest in situations of social instability, such as during the formation of dominance relationships, the establishment of territorial boundaries, or challenges by a conspecific male for territory or access to mates. However, humans don't just compete for sexual partners. We are orientated to pursue certain biosocial goals, such as belonging to groups which offer protection and care. Failure to meet these goals results in insecure striving, where people believe that they must strive to compete for their social place, versus secure non-striving, where people believe that whether they succeed or fail, others will still value and accept them. People who demonstrate insecure striving have been shown to display higher levels of outgroup animosity, and tend to favor conservative politics. My guest today, Carol Hooven, who wrote an incredible book uh, that I've started to read. You all know that watch and listen at home. I don't read a ton of books, but... In T, the story of testosterone, the hormone that dominates and divides us, Harvard anthropologist Carol Hooven makes a series of claims about the ways testosterone shapes our society. She attributes to it high rates of physical violence, hunger for status, and desire for a high number of sex partners, and identifies the testicles as the source of typically masculine behavior. Hooven got this data by reading one book in college, and from watching a male chimp beat the crap out of a female chimp in Uganda once. The book she read was Richard Wrangham's Demonic Males, Apes and the Origins of Human Violence, which goes into excruciating detail about how sadistically abusive and patriarchal ape societies are, and then comes to the novel conclusion that human civilization has the same dynamic because evolution. All of this happened every morning when the garbage was being dumped at this lodge. So you would be willing to pick up, go a mile or two to go fight with a bunch of strange males. And this is the time of day where baboons are doing their most socializing and their most grooming and gossiping and all that sort of thing. So you were aggressive and you were willing to give up all the social connectedness to go to do this. So it killed half the males in the troop. And what you saw was the entire culture of this troop changed. They became more peaceful. They became more socially affiliative. They sat closer to each other. They had less fighting. They had lower stress hormone levels. Their immune systems worked better, which was the stuff I was mostly studying. By a decade later, after this TB outbreak, the troop still had this characteristic. But the key thing is, all of the nice guy males from the time of the TB pandemic, they had long since died of old age. All of the adult males in the troop now who were carrying on these behaviors, they had shown up as jerky adolescents from some other baboon troop. 
And somehow they were learning, we don't do crap like that here. That's not the way we do stuff here. It was a case of cultural transmission. Ah, uh, never mind that. After saying all sorts of inflammatory things on Fox News and Joe Rogan, because that's apparently how right-wingers sell books these days, Hooven has moved on from her position at Harvard's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology to the Psychology Department to work with Steven Pinker, who is ironically both a biological essentialist and an atheist. She had to make this move because she is not studying biology. She is making broad generalizations about how certain biological factors affect our society for money. Supporting Hooven is the very reputable and trustworthy Washington Initiative for Boys and Men, who've provided us with not one, but four articles espousing the many truths found in the book, including the super confident sounding reasons to trust Carol Hooven's book about testosterone. What I'd like everyone to do now is take a big step back and ask yourself why a men's rights organization would promote the idea that men have a natural advantage over women. I wasn't able to find a copy of Hooven's book on any obscure German websites, but I did read the reviews, and they are very interesting. This reviewer is a misogynist piece of shit, but he's actually got a point. It has been socially acceptable for women to demonstrate traditionally masculine behaviors since Margaret Thatcher took office in 1979. Some women are socially conditioned to be this way, while others are naturally more competitive and individualistic. This is not feminism. Secondly, masculine traits that are deemed toxic in regards to criminality are indeed valued in other contexts all the time. Even the description of Hooven's book equates high testosterone men with the ability to outproduce competitors, which I'm told is still a biological imperative for most people. If this doesn't sell some supplements, I don't know what will. In reality, there is a literal skills gap preventing overtly masculine men from finding women who will put up with their bullshit. The solution? Men need to find ways to live up to healthier relationship expectations, which suggests a trade-off between the degree of male-male competition that increases testosterone and the expression of paternal care that requires a decrease in testosterone. The urge to nurture, show compassion, and be in community are human traits. The desire to dominate, segregate, and procreate are animal traits. It has nothing to do with hormones. In a culture of competition, sporting spaces are strongholds for simplistic, binary conceptualizations of sex and gender, with this instrumental view of sport, wherein winning, and thus achieving material reward, motivates participation. Legislators can construct a narrative where trans girls are a threat to cisgender girls' future success, mobilizing effect and emotion to justify transgender discrimination. The current transphobic medical consensus is that Physical attributes that contribute to elite athletic performance are due to exposure in gonadal males with functional androgen receptors to much higher levels of testosterone during growth and development and throughout the athletic career. It's important to note here that when this manifesto states, compared to biological females, biological males have greater lean body mass, larger hearts, higher cardiac outputs, larger hemoglobin mass, larger VO2 max, greater glycogen utilization, higher anaerobic capacity, and different economy of motion, they are referring to elite sub 99th percentile athletes only. This statement is about extremes, not the population as a whole. In a real fight, she would destroy 99% of uh, regular guys. The unbiased medical consensus is that there's an approximately 10 kilogram difference in lean body mass between elite male and female athletes. What is not agreed upon is how lean body mass affects performance. Athletic performance is a complex trait that is influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. Sex steroid serum levels and body composition are under strong genetic control, with 80 to 85% of skeletal muscle mass and strength inherited from parents. It's true that there are no women built like LeBron James, but LeBron James didn't get that way simply by having a lot of testosterone in his system during puberty. Most people who are 6 foot 8 and 250 pounds are never going to be an elite athlete. Michael Phelps' physique doesn't stand out amongst his peers, but his body's natural suppression of lactic acid is what sets him apart. Still, that advantage alone does not automatically make him a gifted athlete. 
some of the most successful male athletes of all time never really bothered to develop lean body mass at all. How long do you think Tom Brady is going to last on a WNBA court? Does he have a natural advantage outside of his sport? Or even outside the position of quarterback? Male puberty does not endow everyone who goes through it physical superiority over all women. Yet for some reason, no other natural physical traits are screened for by international sports federations as a basis for preventing an athlete from competing. From Katie Sanduina, the second-generation circus performer who, legend has it, got her name by beating bodybuilding pioneer Eugene Sandow in a lifting competition, to Karen Marshall, the Wall Street financial analyst who walked in off the street and won the men's 165-pound class at the 1979 Empire State Games, there have always been ladies who have challenged the demand for gendered athletics. Women's track and field first made its appearance at the Olympics in 1928. After the event, multiple newspapers reported that in the women's 800-meter race, five competitors did not cross the finish line, with the runners falling headlong to the ground of the prostrate and distressed forms. Turns out this was completely made up, but still prompted the IAAF to cancel the women's 800-meter until 1960. The 1936 and 1948 Olympics expanded women's gymnastics to include the rings, but was promptly shut down by the U.S. men's team manager, who didn't like the way the women judges voted. By 1952, the women's division was restructured. Today, there are six events for men, and only four for women. 1952 was also the year that the USSR joined the Olympic Federation, which immediately prompted many concerns about fairness, as Eastern Bloc athletes had a notable advantage over the competition. They would be accused of blood doping, along with every other crime imaginable, for the next 40 years. Turns out providing healthy food and free fitness classes to all citizens has nothing to do with the overall athleticism of a nation. It's just drugs. Take drugs, get good at sports. Here's a completely unrelated CIA document I found about Soviet athletics. Most of it is redacted. Anywho, Title IX banned sex discrimination in federally funded education programs in 1972, which led to a tenfold increase in women's athletic participation. Author of the bill, Democratic Senator Birch Bay, called it an important first step in the effort to provide for the women of America something that is rightfully theirs. Oh. How nice of him to give all those poor ladies a handout. In 2023, the Biden administration announced their change to Title IX regulations on students' eligibility for athletic teams, stating, Sex-related criteria that limit participation of some transgender students may be permitted. In some cases, when they enable the school to achieve an important educational objective, such as fairness in competition, or preventing sports-related injury. Less than a month before, World Athletics President Lord Coe banned anyone who's gone through male puberty from competing in women's world competition. Also in 2023, the International Chess Federation banned transgender women from competing in the women's division, proving that it's not about fairness, safety, or physical advantage. To quote Pasteur, the false notion of testosterone and performance does not expand, but circumscribes itself ever more narrowly. The insecure person sees all relationships as competition. The point of feminism is that we can all be secure in ourselves and do not need to be provided for. What we do need is for discrimination to end. Transgender athletes, no matter how big and muscular, are not discriminating against or taking anything away from cis women. Suggesting that anyone with testicles can come in and start dominating women's sports is discrimination. So do transphobes think that there are just men out there who suck at their chosen sport, but want to win so badly that they uproot their entire existence and transition into women? I'm not a trained therapist or anything, but I think it's unhealthy to assume that the reason someone is doing something is part of some diabolical scheme to win at a game. In 2019, tennis great Martina Navratilova concocted a story about an imaginary man that decided one day to be female 
So he took hormones, won everything in sight, including a small fortune, then reversed his decision and went back to making babies. She goes on to describe hundreds of athletes who have changed gender by declaration and achieved honors as women that were beyond their capabilities as men, but also says that trans women who have had the deed done surgically rarely enjoy a competitive advantage. When she was accused of being transphobic on Twitter, she claimed she was being attacked and then used her incredible privilege to get her response published in the fucking times. But what she and every other fart are unable to do is provide a specific example of a person who has gone through male puberty and how that has given them an empirically observable physical advantage. That is because there are no examples of dominant transgender athletes. I think the most compelling argument for the inclusion of transgender athletes is, well, they're just not very good. Those who have found success grew up playing sports at a high level and still lose to cis women on a regular basis. And then there are many trans women on this list that continued to compete against men after transitioning. It's amazing to me that this is the list people use to criticize trans women in sports. Some people argue that the mere participation of trans athletes is unfair. As in the case of Glenique Frank, the transgender hobbyist runner who placed 6,160th place amongst women in the 2023 London Marathon, just a month after running the Tokyo Marathon in the men's division. In a statement that dials back feminism by at least a century, competitor Maru Yamauchi compared Glenique's run to an adult in a kid's race? or a motorcycle in a bicycle competition. Make sure to check out Mara's new book, Men Are 180 Horsepower Superbikes, Women Are Pink Tricycles with Sparkly Tassels on the Handlebars, available exclusively through PragerU. So with this apparent disparity in place, what do you think we could do to help the 14,000 women Glenique beat get faster for next year? Is getting rid of one transgender lady going to improve their times? Or I don't know, maybe we could find a way to provide them all with greater access to the resources they need to become better athletes? Uh, no? Okay. So, without further ado, here are 23 transgender ladies just doing the best they can. When there was a transgender fighter that was uh, hiding the fact, found Fox, was hiding the fact that they were biologically male and competed twice as a woman beating the fuck out of these women. If you know anything about Joe Rogan's color commentary, it's that he blows everything way out of proportion. And the girl, the wife, walks right up to Johnny and punches him as hard <laughs> as she can right in the stomach, and he falls over. And I go, hey, he fell. You know, like, he, he really got hurt. This statement is not only transphobic, it's objectively false to anyone who understands the sport of mixed martial arts. Fallon Fox's first fight was against amateur Elijah Helsper in 2012, whose previous fight was in 2009. The match ended when Helsper randomly dislocated her elbow while in full guard. No one got beat up. In 2013, Fox beat Erica Newsom in 39 seconds, whose only other fight was a loss to a cis woman one year previous in 36 seconds. Fox then went up against Alana Jones in an epic 16-minute battle, winning by submission in the third round. She then lost in the third round to UFC fighter Ashley Evans-Smith, who has since spoken out against trans women in sports and is currently serving a 14-month suspension for steroid use. Fox would go on to submit Heather Bassett in two rounds in March 2014. Later that year, she defeated Tamika Brents, the fight being called due to injuries sustained to Brents' forehead and orbital bone. After the match, Brents was quoted to say that she had never felt that much strength in a fight and inferred that it was due to Fox being born a man. This story was immediately latched onto by far-right critics, who began claiming that a new transgender fighter was crushing women's skulls. Fox's win is often paired with this picture, which is actually the 18-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Kay Hansen after she was pummeled by cis woman Kaylin Schwartz in 2018. By the way, here's what Kay Hansen is all about. Total coincidence, I'm sure. 
the injuries Tamika Brent sustained were far less severe. From what I can see, the cut on Brent's head seems to be due to an unintentional headbutt or 12 to 6 elbow from Fox while on the ground. Still, Brent's is perfectly aware and capable when the fight gets called, and is able to get right up and walk back to her corner on her own accord. Misha Tate, who has also publicly argued Fox's womanhood, experienced the same injury during her 2015 win against Sarah McMahon. There are many other examples of cis women inflicting this exact same injury on some of the best female fighters in the world. Let's put all this into perspective for a second. Without looking it up, how big do you think Fallon Fox is? Height and weight, go. Now, what I want you to do is think of a man that you know who is 5 foot 7 and 135 pounds, and then tell me what inherent physical advantage he has over anyone. You guys also know that weight classes exist, right? If you believe that Fox has an inherent advantage over other women, you could just make her fight bigger girls. If she dominates, as the Joe Rogans of the world claim, then you could move her up another weight class. There are literally hundreds of competitors in the women's featherweight and lightweight divisions Fox could go up against. But then you'd have to accept that transgender women are women, and that's too complicated for you. Meanwhile, the first trans man to win a professional men's boxing match was in 2018. Here. Okay, before I say his name, just take a look at this fight and try to guess which one of the fighters is trans. Since this win, the 37-year-old Patricio Manuel has become the face of Everlast Boxing Equipment, following in the iconic lineage of Jack Dempsey and Sugar Ray Robinson. Before transitioning in 2013, Manuel was a five-time USA female national amateur boxing champion and competed in the 2012 Women's U.S. Olympic Trials. This experience gives him an inherent advantage over his opponents. You could have been, you know, one of the greatest female world champions, though you would throw it all away to be yourself. And I tell them that's how bad I felt living that lie. Laurel Hubbard is the first transgender woman to compete in the Olympic Games. A lifelong weightlifter, she broke New Zealand junior men's records in the 90s, only to retire in 2001. After transitioning in 2012, she began competing against women at the age of 39. Starting with a win described by the Herald Sun as unremarkable, she would go on to win two gold medals at the 2019 Pacific Games and another at the Roma 2020 World Cup. This qualified her for the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, where she failed all three of her snatch attempts and did not compete in the clean and jerk. It's now assumed that she'll retire, stating that age has caught up with her. Let's break down these numbers a bit. In that first victory, Hubbard measured in at 6 foot 1 and 131.83 kilograms, 9 kilograms heavier than the second place winner, Ayunara Sapaya. In fact, the majority of her opponents that day were regulars in the 75 plus kilogram division, with Hubbard's smallest opponent weighing 55 kilograms less than her. However, Hubbard's lifts were no better than those of Dang Wei, who is 5 foot 3 and holds records in the 64 kilogram division. At the 2019 Pacific Games, silver medalist Fiegia Stowers. Figaiga Stowers. Figaiga. Stowers lifted more than Hubbard in her first two snatch attempts, but failed on her third, giving Hubbard the victory. In the clean and jerk, Sapaya beat Hubbard by a considerable margin of 9 kilograms, but Hubbard's combined numbers were enough to earn her another gold medal. The 87 plus kilogram silver medalist at the Roma 2020 World Cup, Anastasia Lysenko, is also a regular in the 75 plus kilogram division, weighing 30 kilograms less than Hubbard she lifted two kilograms less than Hubbard on each of her lifts. At the Tokyo Olympics, Hubbard weighed in at 146.7 kilograms and was fourth heaviest amongst her peers. At no point did Laurel Hubbard dominate or even challenge the world's best women's weightlifters. Tiffany Abreu is a 38-year-old volleyball player who played in the Men's Brazilian Superliga before transitioning in 2014. At 6 foot 4, she hardly stands out and is the oldest member on each squad she's played on. In 2018, she ran as a candidate for the Brazilian Democratic Movement Party. 
In 2022, the team she played on won the Brazilian Cup. At least it says that here on OutSports, but I can't seem to find her on the roster or in this broadcast of the championship match. Veronica Ivy is a competitive cyclist turned transgender activist. In 2018, she broke the world 200-meter sprint record for women in the 35 to 39-year-old age range, a record she held for less than a day, until cis woman Sarah Fader broke it later on in the very same competition. Fader would also best Ivy in the 500-meter sprint, but still decided to pull out of the event at the last minute, claiming concerns about fairness. Shortly after this win, Ivy responded to a fateful series of tweets from tennis pro Martina Navratilova, prompting her aforementioned response in the Times. Renee Richards grew up as a multi-sport athlete, culminating in an invitation to play for the New York Yankees. Giving up athletics to work in ophthalmology, she played some professional men's tennis in the 1950s, and transitioned in 1975 at the age of 41. After applying to play in the Women's U.S. Open, she was outed by TV anchor and father of Tucker Carlson, Richard Carlson. Oh yeah, you heard me. Check this out. The most effective means to that goal, that is, the stability of relationships between countries is international broadcasting. With it, perceptions can be influenced and difficult concepts can be clarified and explained to people and successfully sued the U.S. Tennis Association for discrimination. In her appearance at the 1977 U.S. Open, she lost to Virginia Wade in the first round and again in the doubles final. From 1977 to 1981, she was ranked as high as 20th overall. She is known for her unique left-handed serve, which is said to give her a natural advantage. She went on to coach fart queen Martina Navratilova to two Wimbledon wins, and in an ironic twist, has also made a number of transphobic statements in response to modern transgender athletes. Yeah, I mean, women weren't even allowed into Horace Mann, the prestigious 60k a year prep school you went to, until 1976. So let's not suggest that you were chosen on your merits. Bobby Lancaster is a 73-year-old transgender woman who experienced some success as an amateur golfer on the men's circuit in the 1970s and transitioned in 2012. Playing against women 40 years younger, she failed to finish within the top 100 at the LPGA tournament in 2013. After a fan complained about her to a local newspaper, a full-length feature film was made about her life and was nominated for a sports Emmy. She no longer plays professionally and works as a family physician and transgender advocate. Lana Lawless is a former police officer who played golf recreationally for 21 years before transitioning in 2006. She entered her first competition against women in 2007 and was unable to make the semifinals. In 2008, she returned to win the long drive competition. The 55-year-old Lawless beating out 21-year-old Phyllis Metti by four yards in an event heavily mired by wind conditions. The next year, she was banned by the LPGA, prompting her to file a lawsuit, which she won, allowing athletes like Bobby Lancaster to compete. Mayan Bagger is a Danish golfer who was raised on the sport, being photographed with golf icon Gary Norman as a child. After transitioning in 1995, she won the South Australian Ladies Amateur Championships in 1999, 2001, and 2002, and soon after, Bagger would become the first transgender woman to go pro. In 2005, she played her first tournament on the Ladies European Tour, finishing in 35th place. Her highest ranking in 2006 was 91st place. Natalie Van Gogh is a former professional racing cyclist. From 2009 to 2021, she won one race and placed within the top 10 in some others. Savannah Burton is the first transgender woman to be named to the Canadian National Women's Dodgeball Team. 
her team would finish fourth in both the 2015 and 2017 World Dodgeball Federation World Championships. Catherine McGregor is an Australian cricket commentator who, in 2016, at the age of 60, joined the premier over-50 women's national cricket league. She has yet to accomplish her goal of playing in the more competitive women's Big Bash league. Brittany Stinson grew up playing boys football for four different high schools and now plays for the Orlando Anarchy women's football team. In 2017, her team lost the Women's Football Alliance Division III championship game. Lauren Jessica transitioned in the year 2000 at the age of 26 and started finding success in the sport of fell running. From 2008 to 2012, she won a handful of premier events, but in 2015 refused to provide UK athletics with blood samples and instead decided to violently attack an official. As of 2017, she is serving an 18-year prison sentence for attempted murder. This is a very tragic story. But the fact of the matter is, this is not Lauren Jessica. This is Victoria Wilkinson, one of the many cis women who have consistently put up better numbers than Jessica. This is Lauren Jessica. Because you can always tell, right? Roberta Cowell was a British race car driver and fighter pilot who is said to be the first person to undergo gender-affirming surgery in the UK. She competed against men with some success from the 1950s to the 1970s. Michelle Duff was a Grand Prix motorcycle racer from 1960 to 1967. She transitioned in 1984. Charlie Christina Martin is a 41-year-old British endurance racer who competes against men. Apayuk Retan is the first transgender woman to participate in the Iditarod sled dog race in Alaska, which is not a gendered event. She finished 28th place in 2019 and 37th place in 2022. Former Marine and world record-holding powerlifter Janae Marie Kroczaleski competed against men in the 2000s and fully transitioned in 2015. She continues to lift recreationally and occasionally posts current personal records on her Instagram page. Jaya Salua is a Fafafine footballer who played for the men's Samoan national team in the 2014 World Cup qualifier. After medically transitioning in 2018, she appeared in the 2019 Pacific Games, again on the men's team. She has never competed against women. Parinya Charoenfall is a Fafafine Thai person who fought men for a brief period in the late 90s. Entering the ring in full makeup and pigtails, the fighter known as Nong Tum would revitalize the Muay Thai industry with her flamboyant drag performances. With the money made from her many wins, Nong Tum was able to afford sex reassignment surgery and retired from Muay Thai in just a year. She would return in 2006 as a fully transitioned woman to beat male fighter Kenshiro Luk Chow Mek Them Thong, but in 2007 lost to cis woman Pernilla Johansson by decision in three rounds. She now teaches Muay Thai and aerobics with her husband in Thailand. Hannah Mouncey represented the Australian men's handball team before transitioning in 2015. In 2018, she played her first game with the women's team, where she scored four goals in a 24-32 loss to Kazakhstan. She immediately faced discrimination and was left off the Australian women's national team. Mouncey was then nominated for the Australian Football League's women's draft, but was declined based on the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act which allows gender discrimination in any sport where strength, stamina, or physique is relevant. She was eventually allowed to play for the VFLW Darabin Falcons, which is the equivalent of a minor league baseball team, and found reasonable success there. 
Although publicly releasing blood tests that show testosterone levels well below AFL requirements, she decided to withdraw from the AFL draft. In 2022, Mouncey returned to Australian women's handball for the Asian Women's Handball Championship, where her team would finish in ninth place. Michelle Dumaresk is a professional downhill mountain bike competitor who transitioned in 1996 and began competing against women in 2001. After winning a novice female class competition at Bear Mountain, she would go pro, eventually winning the Canada Cup Series in 2002, 2003, and 2004. At the 2004 World Mountain Bike Championships in France, she finished in 17th place. I was unable to find out who won the Canada Cup in 2005, or any other year for that matter. But in 2006, Michelle had a dream that a man attacked her at the podium, and later on that year, the boyfriend of second place winner Danica Schroeder ran up and passed his girlfriend a t-shirt that said, 100% pure woman champ, as a form of protest. I also cannot find whether or not Danica Schroeder ever won a race again in her entire career. Dumaresk has not competed since, saying, That was the moment I stopped loving the sport. I thought my life might be over at that moment in front of a crowd of people. If someone was going to attack me, they were going to attack me. There was nothing I could do about it. I just hoped they would do it in a dark alley and not in front of the media and my family. Cece Teffler is known for being the first transgender woman to win a Division II NCAA title. With a background in gymnastics, she ranked 390th in the men's hurdles in 2017. After the NCAA sanctioned one year of testosterone suppression treatment, she began competing against women, where she ranked second in the pentathlon, sixth in the 60-meter dash, and tied for 17th in the high jump. Placing third in the 60-meter hurdles and seventh in the 200-meter dash qualified her for the 2019 NCAA Women's Division II Outdoor Track and Field Championships, where she placed sixth in the 60-meter hurdles and first in the 400-meter hurdles. She was unable to provide proof that she stayed below the testosterone requirement for 12 months and was barred from the 2020 Olympics. She has yet to compete since. Finally, Leah Thomas was a Division I leader in men's swimming before transitioning in 2019. In March 2022, she became the first transgender woman to win a Division I title in the 500-meter freestyle. At that event, Thomas also finished fifth in the 200-meter freestyle and last in the 100-meter freestyle. It would be her last time representing the University of Pennsylvania who went on to nominate her for the 2022 NCAA Woman of the Year Award. We leave you with an excerpt from a beautiful piece written by 2020 Olympic silver medalist Erica Sullivan, who placed third to Leah that day. Like anyone else in this sport, Leah has trained diligently to get where she is and has followed all of the rules and guidelines put before her. Like anyone else in this sport, Leah doesn't win every time. And when she does, she deserves, like anyone else in this sport, to be celebrated for her hard-won success, not labeled a cheater simply because of her identity. Right now, the world is facing a multitude of crises that require our attention, time, and energy. Millions of people in Ukraine and around the world are fighting for survival. Globally, there have been more than six million deaths due to COVID-19. What we need now more than ever is compassion and to come together as a global community. And yet, this is the time that, here in the U.S., we are wasting resources and finding ourselves divided over a question that should have a simple answer. Should the transgender community be included and treated equally in all areas of life, including sports? Yes, transgender athletes should not be denied equal rights when compared to cisgender athletes. Many of those who oppose transgender athletes like Leah being able to participate claim to be protecting women's sports. As a woman in sports, I can tell you that I know what the real threats to women's sports are. Sexual abuse and harassment, 
unequal pay and resources, and a lack of women in leadership. Transgender girls and women are nowhere on this list. Women's sports are stronger when all women, including trans women, are protected from discrimination and free to be their true selves. Good night and good luck.